Hello everybody, I am Luca Cantore, musician and musicologist, professor at the Escola Superior de Musica de Catalunya in Barcelona and at the Universidad de Veiro, researcher at the NetMD Institute and concert pianist. It's my pleasure to address you all and thus prepare the ground for the debate on April 30th within the Music Performance Studies Today series. My speech, titled Research in Action Intersecting Pathways Between Musicology and Performance, will frame the experience of my recent artistic project in a global reflection on possible ways of interpreting our classical music outside of the historiographic and stylistic principles we created almost a century ago. In the version project, in particular, musicological research turns into a catalyst to propose true versions in the sense that popular music gives to this term. Versions with a stamp of originality, sufficient to show facets of the work that we would not see without them, but without ever abandoning the sonic frame of, of what we understand as today as Western art music. I will explain this in more detail on the 30th. For now, as a simple advance, I will propose some fragments of one of the few recitals that I was able to give during the season on November 8th, 2020, a year in which, according to my schedule, I should have performed concerts in 12 countries on three continents. In that recital I played, a part of the repertoire I've recorded in a recently released double album, Nine Etude by Helen de Mongeroux, and my peculiar version of the Walstein Sonata by her contemporary Beethoven. As the length of this video is limited, I've chosen some extracts from that recital to illustrate four dimensions of this project that seems like a good introduction to our discussion. In the first place, Mongeroux, a great French improviser with little focus on composition, whose scarce output uh, would suffice to demonstrate how performance can transform a work into one thing or another without changing a single note. And what I do with her etude is to move as far away as possible from the stylist principles we usually associate with the music of someone more like her in 1764. This little jam is just a brief example. In other cases, surprises are even greater. This page was first published in 1816, when Schumann was six years old. And the same for this other passage, where it is impossible not to think of Chopin or why not for it.
I don't modify anything Monger wrote in her scores. But by playing her music so far from the neoclassical paradigm to which we remain anchored, I intend to show how much beauty can emerge when we renounce the concepts of classic and romantic and the historiographical teleological plot that sustained them. In the case of Beethoven, my inversions do include a significant intervention on the score. In the Valsen Sonata, for instance, I convert the usual three movement structure into a unitary composition of 40 minutes, divided into 10 sections with the same improvised prelude, three interludes improvised on Beethoven's own Adagio Molto, and the same improvised cadenza before the final prestissimo. The reconstruction of the scherzo later turned into the Bagatelle, who, 56, and a hypothetical first version of the Andante Favori, both from the work notes in the Landsberg 6 sketchbook. Moreover, I often replace the original melodic method with previous version later discards, also from the same um, sketchbook, as in the following examples.
cognitive challenge posed by these variants is combined with a surprise created by the same improvised sections, all of them always based on Beethoven's sketches. Finally, I'll try to exalt the intrinsically experimental nature of this sonata using a biomechanical and timbral inspiration that creatively combines the research underpinning my books, Tone Moves, A History of Piano Technique, and Beethoven at the Piano.
precise theoretical framework supports all the decisions of this project, uh, whose methodology is firmly embedded in that artistic research, which is the subject of so many debates today in continental Europe. It will be a real pleasure to talk about it in this Music Performance Studies Today panel. Thank you very much and see you soon. Hello, my name is Faraz Graham and I'm a PhD candidate in musicology at UCLA. The work I'm about to play is a hybrid and I'm titling it the Chopin Rachmaninoff Sonata No. 2 in B-flat minor, Opus 3536. This is directly related to the paper I'll give on Friday. In a moment, I'm going to employ a 19th century concert practice of binding together movements of different works. Rachmaninoff sometimes did this on stage. My reason is heuristic, in part. I'll begin with movements of Chopin's second sonata as heavily influenced by Rachmaninoff's historical interpretation, his performance practice, and personhood, followed by the finale of his own second sonata in B-flat minor. In 1931, Rachmaninoff reduced his own sonata's length and simplified many of the complexities and technical challenges. Much is lost, I believe, in that edition, so I will therefore perform the original 1913 version for you, less often heard today. For Rachmaninoff, both sonatas represented two sides of the same coin. They pointed to each composer's way of affirming death or life. Chopin's affirms death, Rachmaninoff affirms life, hope, and deliverance. Much of this relates to the status of their home country's freedom and impending collapse. I won't explain this all now, but do note that in the Russian Orthodox Church, Death may be seen as a necessary prelude for moving on to an elevated existence to come, also known as deification or theosis. I will here point out a couple of details that will help relate this performance to the paper I'll give on Friday. Rachmaninoff takes ideas from the bell-like figures of Chopin's funeral march and subtly adapts them into his own sonata as he moves into an idealized harmonic space, for example. Rachmaninoff, but slow down a little so you can hear it. A little bit faster. He likewise adopts Chopin's hand position at the beginning of the funeral march and uses that as a means for transformation. Thus, again, note the position. in Rachmaninoff, very nearly identical. I argue in my paper as well that Eastern Orthodox principles guided his recorded performance of the Chopin Sonata on a structural level. I'm not claiming to be Sergei Rachmaninoff, but I'm performing as a pianist musicologist who believes that it's possible to learn more from directly embodying music than mere listening allows. And I hope you will receive my hybrid performance in that spirit. Thank you very much.
Hello, my name is John Rink. I'm Professor of Musical Performance Studies at the University of Cambridge, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this brief introduction to the longer talk that I'll be giving in a couple of days' time. This presentation is entitled Informed Listening in Action, or How Might Knowledge Shape How We Hear and Judge Performances? It takes as a point of departure one of the four questions guiding the discussion of this panel. This guiding question is, what does it mean to evaluate a performance? And from this, I've defined two additional focal questions. The one is uh, familiar to you from the subtitle of the presentation, how might knowledge shape how we hear and judge performances? And the second follows from that, what might informed listening of this kind entail? Now I'm using as a uh, the mainstay of my discussion today and in a few days time, the experiences that I had as a member of the jury of the 17th International Chopin Competition in October 2015. Over three weeks in Warsaw, uh, the jury of 17 people uh, listened to something like 80 participants um, in many, many recitals, well over 150, uh, that, that took place in three rounds uh, plus finals. In the three rounds, the contestants were asked to play recitals of up to 25 minutes, 40 minutes and 60 minutes respectively, and in the finals they played one of Chopin's two piano concertos. We assessed them on a scale from 1 to 25 points, 25 being high, and uh, decided whether to promote them to the next round. I wrote about my experience as a member of the jury in an article that I published last year called Judging Chopin, the Evaluation of Musical Experience. The talk that I'll be giving as part of our panel discussion is not directly related to it, although of course it overlaps. What I'm going to do is to discuss a number of case study performances in terms of four main categories, text, expressive technique, communication, and architecture as sound and as process. And what I've done is to compile a recital of performances from the Chopin recital that were listened to in this watch party and then discuss in more detail in the presentation to follow. So in the watch party, you'll hear um, something like 10 performances or excerpts from performances in these four categories. So under text, we'll start with Alexei Tartakovsky, who plays an excerpt from the Mazurka Opus 30, number two, and then two performances of the Nocturne in D flat major, Opus 27, number two, by Annie Drew and Michal Szymanowski, the transition to the second melodic statement and then part thereof, and it will be interesting for you to compare the two. In the next part of the uh, playlist of, of the recital, we're here under the heading of Expressive Technique, two performances of the Etude in F Major, Opus 10, number eight. The first by Michele Candotti and the second by um, Alyosha Yurinich. Uh, these are quite different performances and I think you'll be interested to hear them. In the third section, entitled Communication, we'll hear Arseny Tarasievich Nikolaev play the last three minutes of Chopin's second ballad, Opus 38, and then uh, Kate Liu perform the second movement of the B minor sonata, Opus 58, followed by the ending of the third movement. Um, and then finally, in the last section, Architecture and Sound in its Process, the first prize winner, Seong Jin Cho, will play four of the preludes from Opus 28. He performed the entire set in the third round, but from uh, that entire set, we'll hear four performances today, number two in A minor, the last part of the Raindrop Prelude, number 15 in D flat major, number 16 in B flat minor, and number 24 in D minor. What I'm going to do in the full length presentation is to discuss the notes that I took and the criteria that I used to evaluate the performances in order to answer those guiding and focal questions. What does it mean to evaluate a performance? What difference does knowledge make? And what might informed listening of this kind entail? I hope you enjoy listening to the recital. It's about 25 minutes all told, drawn from the first and third rounds in particular. Uh, enjoy it and I'll join you again in a few days time. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Mina Doan Tandek. I'm a classical concert pianist and a musicologist. And I am currently a performance studies supervisor and examiner at the University of Cambridge. The title of the presentation that I will give as part of the Music Performance Studies Today conference panel, uh, specifically devoted to 20th century pianism, is Revisiting the Page and the Stage. I will uh, briefly review in my presentation the latest manifestations of the so-called page-to-stage approach, um, particularly in reference to two myths that keep cropping up. The myth of a direct and immediate route from the score to performance, and the myth of the intelligent musician, as I will call it. And then I will talk about what happens and what does not happen and what might happen uh, in the creative space artistic space between um, the score and a performance from a performance perspective. With this background in mind, I have pre prepared several recordings that I will uh, share with you in the rest of this video. Um, some of these were prepared uh, during the various stages of the lockdown, uh, pandemic lockdown at home, using uh, modest technologies available domestically. And for optimal sound quality, I would like to ask my listeners to um, hear these recordings, listen to these recordings uh, with headphones and uh, at a moderate loudness level. The first piece I uh, played for you is uh, Johann Sebastian Bach's Corrente from his sixth keyboard partita in E minor. And uh, this interpretation uh, was developed particularly uh, by paying attention to the gesture of embodied and affective uh, experiences, the manual experiences that the Corante uh, generates for me. Um, and it had tempo, tempo implications uh, and opened up a whole new hermeneutical realm, as I will discuss um, um, in greater detail. I would like my listeners perhaps to listen to the persistence uh, of the entrainment between the two hands that I uh, attempted to create, which represents actually the image of a dancing couple for me. The next piece I recorded is Scarlatti's, Domenico Scarlatti's keyboard sonata in F minor, uh, K481. And this recording was prompted by a recent textualist analysis of the score of the sonata, which uh, unsurprisingly attempts to discipline the performer and um, the performer's body. And the point I would like to make is that the temporality of a performance cannot be derived from score-based analysis. So here I complexify the lived temp temporality uh, of the sonata and try to create, uh, if you like, a wondrous, strange um, atmosphere through the time work that I carried out. Next, you will hear me performing um, again Johann Sebastian Bach uh, Prelude in G Major from the second book of Well-Tempered Clavier. And here I question the idea that in Baroque music, each self-contained movement uh, needs to retain the same tempo throughout. Um, so this is again about the time work that uh, can be carried out creatively. And I don't see any compelling reason in scholarship why a prelude from Bach uh, should retain the same tempo throughout. In the next two recordings, um, I have created a slow movement and a finale from two of Beethoven's sonatas, and the question that uh, has driven this performance is, why is it regarded a creative practice when a composer um, borrows and alters uh, materials from another composer and that this is not acceptable when a classical performer attempts uh, to do the same, to change the score, if you like. Uh, who has agency in performance, and importantly, who might be offended by this kind of a performance of, uh, of Beethoven's works? The next recording uh, I, of Chopin's uh, posthumous etude in D flat, I call it First Contact, as it captures the very first time that I touched uh, a new uh, grand piano, it was a Boston Steinway. Um, on the day of the concert, before I played uh, an all Chopin um, recital. The aim here, here is to acknowledge the huge uh, important role the musical in, uh, instrument plays in performance making, uh, which has not been recognized sufficiently in my view in scholarship, and to show what happens when a pianist and a new piano meet, 
uh, how they make friends in a very short time. And I think my listeners will be able to hear the sounds of the process of discovery as it happened in this recording. <coughs> Finally, I perform uh, Mendelssohn's Venetian Gondola song uh, from his Songs Without Words. And this one has been uh, prompted uh, by the question of what might happen if we bring the affordances of uh, full affordances of the recording uh, studio into the classical genre. Uh, so this is an, I present this as an example of acoustic choreography, if you like. Ultimately, the question, in my view, concerns finding ways of continuously challenging the authoritarian discourses of textualism in the discipline and embracing diversity and plurality in performance making in the classical genre. I hope you enjoyed the rest of this video and the panel. Thank you.
In many of his works, Beethoven was attracted to the potential of employing contrasting musical sections within a larger continuity, as in the opening movement of the Sonata Pathétique, for instance. In the first movement of the Tempest Sonata, Beethoven compresses this idea of a split tempo while exploiting its formal and psychological possibilities. This was not his original idea as entries in the Kessler sketchbook show. While at Heiligenstadt, Beethoven turned his attention to a sonata in D minor when just a few unwritten pages remained in the sketchbook. A revealing series of sketches preserve his initial conception for this sonata in three movements, and he then flipped back in the nearly filled sketchbook to search for room to continue his work. Twenty-five pages earlier, Beethoven found enough remaining space to enter a revised draft of the first movement, one in which an affinity to the finished work is readily apparent. There's no question about this sequence of events, since Beethoven made folds marking the placement of the important second draft in the middle of the book. That the significance of these sketches has been largely overlooked is due in part to their irregular positioning in the original manuscript held in Vienna. Although the traces preserved in Kessler are an incomplete record, we can discern four compositional stages. Beethoven's first sketches were surely preceded by improvisation at the keyboard presumably on the Anton Walter forte piano that Czerny described having seen around this time in the composer's lodgings. The sketches at the end of Kessler diverge from the finished work, but are bound to it through a genetic process. Study of these sketches in relation to the subsequent draft and completed version reveals the creative imagination in action. Beethoven's second draft depicts the first movement in a synoptic form compressed on a single page. Much is left out, but the notated musical content corresponds roughly to the sonata as we know it. The fourth and final stage in this reconstruction is embodied in the completed piece and further insights about the compositional process would surely have been preserved in Beethoven's autograph score, which unfortunately has not survived. Beethoven's original draft is shown in our next image, transcribed from his original manuscript. Not only the opening motive, but the key texture and character or arresting. The passionate, almost operatic character of this theme in D minor is underscored by its tremolo accompaniment figuration in the bass, which sounds an open fifth, D to A, omitting the third of the harmony. The mysterious tension of this idea invites comparison not only to passages of the finished sonata starting in measure 21, but to the beginning of the Ninth Symphony, another work in D minor. An intertextual affinity is not limited to Beethoven's oeuvre. The character of a turbulent D minor idiom touched by the uncanny or demonic reaches back to Mozart's Don Giovanni and Requiem and forward to Brahms's D minor concerto. Let us now hear the first draft of the opening movement of the Tempest Sonata. I made all of the recordings for the present lecture recital three years ago in connection with my work as co-curator of Vienna's first museum devoted to Beethoven, which is located in the Probostgasse in Heiligenstadt, the site where the composer resided during the summer of 1802.
To open a musical work with a rising broken chord is a familiar enough idea. The Mannheim Symphonic School had trademarked that technique by the 1740s. Such Mannheim rocket themes surface in the finale of Mozart's G minor symphony and the opening of Beethoven's own first piano sonata in F minor, opus two number one. Beethoven's D minor sketch, however, blends this well-worn motivic idea with other elements creating an oppressive synthesis. The tremolo on the open fifth, D to A, yields to a chromatically descending continuation in the bass, while the upper melody leads into an intensely expressive falling contour. A second phrase restates the rising broken chord figure on an unstable dissonance, before this parallel gesture resolves firmly in D minor. Beethoven specifies no tempo and dynamics, but the implied character is sharply etched, presumably allegro and forte. The rest of Beethoven's movement plan shows him mapping out the defining junctures of the musical form. The designation MG stands for Mittelgedanke, or second subject. This lyrical idea in the contrasting key of B-flat major is based on descending steps of the scale. Beethoven then skips forward to the cadence of the first part, the end of the exposition, extending this motive of repeated chords in turn to lead into the development section. He next envisions the end of the development section over a dominant pedal point in the bass Beethoven ventures a rhythmically intensified version of the rising broken chord motive played against an inverted form of the same figure in the bass. A variant of the repeated chord then returns whereupon the music takes a surprising new turn. A dolce phrase in triple meter in D major. This gesture marks the crucial place where Beethoven later incorporates passages of recitative bathed mysteriously in the sounds generated by the sustaining pedal, music arising from strings with raised dampers, senza sordino. The only remaining notated section in this sketch belongs to the coda, where a swift 6-8 transformation of the opening theme leads into a dissolving close in the low register. The next draft of this movement, written in the middle of Kessler, resembles the finished work in that the slow, fast tempo duality has become the main focus. A plan for the beginning of the exposition and much of the development is laid out. However, as with the first draft, not all sections of the movement are yet notated. One of the many divergences from the completed version is the very first chord. The A major sonority is notated in exactly the same position, but the opening arpeggiation, or broken chord, is missing. Here as elsewhere, Beethoven develops a sonority the initial first inversion A major chord played with pedal, not by thinking forward, but by imagining what should precede, in this case, an unfolding of each of the pitches starting with the low C sharp, so that a defined rhythm takes shape only from the A, an octave and a sixth higher. The tentative, enigmatic atmosphere of the opening owes much to this device. On the other hand, this draft already contains passages of recitative at the recapitulation. We'll now hear Beethoven's second draft for the opening movement of the sonata. One of many striking differences from the finished work is how this draft ends in the major mode, D major. Having explored how Beethoven conceived this opening movement, 
let's hear the completed movement in full, but after hearing the second draft. One highly striking departure uh, from the familiar version of this sonata is indeed that close in D major that uh, Beethoven employs in this draft, uh, whereas, as we said, another very striking aspect of this draft carried into and intensified in the completed work is the following situation in which the opening arpeggiation yields recitative at the recapitulation, something to give special attention to when we hear the uh, full work with the performance. I'll briefly play those two passages at the piano here. The beginning of the piece. And the 
transformation <clears throat> of that broken chord at the recapitulation. Now hear uh, the complete first movement. 